Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Moscow-born veteran jazz pianist and composer Yelena Ekimov on her new 2021 CD, Adventures of the Wildflower. The CD will come out on her own L&H production label on March 19, 2021. The new double album is the story of a life, birth, death, and rebirth of a Columbine flower backed by a Finnish ensemble. Along with the new material, she opens up about the pandemic and the hope for the future. Enjoy. Thank you for taking a minute out. I think it's probably appropriate to talk about the brand new double album and, you know, just how goofy things are on Earth right now. <laughs> um, a- as usual, I always love your material and uh, Adventures of the Wildflower is another great album. So I guess I want to start off here Thank with the you. timing of this. You know, I think Part of me kind of assumed coming out during a pandemic, it's not ideal because you can't do anything live, but what else are you going to do during a pandemic? Yeah, I've uh, been uh, doing the same thing I've been always doing, actually, uh, except, of course, um, I could not uh, record in Italy. That was a recording session planned in October, which I, uh, of course, could not go to Italy, and, of course, we could not go to Germany to Jazz Ahead uh, convention as we usually do, and de- definitely that was all cancelled. Uh, hopefully, I uh, postponed my re- Italian session, and hopefully, I will record it at some point. And I don't know when. It's been postponed to April, but I don't think April will work either. <laughs> Other than that, yes, I've been doing uh, a lot of composing. Uh, I always have like more than I can handle uh, projects to do. So in all directions, since I am doing more than just composing music and I'm doing paintings and uh, writings and uh, the the running the la- label, even though it's small and it's just my music, but it, there are a lot of things to do with it. I mean, a lot of things to constantly uh attend to. I don't think I've been uh, as affected as many other musicians who lost their tours. Um, I haven't planned any tours, so (laughs) good for me. (laughs) Yeah. So how did you figure all this out in March? What was like your last show and how did you just finally see all of your tour dates go away? I've been... uh, uh, focusing on my, uh, like I said, composing and uh, recording. I uh, never wanted to tour uh, full, like full throat, like as like other musicians do. Uh, not because I, I um, don't think it's it's a good idea, but for me, it it was never a good idea because I uh, had too much stuff going on with um, other things. In music, it was like I, I have to focus. I have to choose between either way being a touring artist or a composer because I cannot do both. Uh, too much involved in uh, in being a composer, and that's uh, that's why I've always played concerts the way on my like on my terms. When I wanted to play concert, I I was when I was classical pianist. Well, I am classical pianist, but uh, <laughs> still, still, I guess can play classical music. Even, even I, I haven't played classical programs for a long time. But when I did, I that was what I wanted to do. I was, wanted to learn uh, whatever program I wanted to and perform it once or twice. And then I got bored with it, and I wanted to do something else. So that's how you know with my jazz um, ensembles, like um, I did the same thing. And of course, when I want to just perform on my own terms, like maybe one or two performances a year, and I, I, I can't really, you know, having a booking agent and, uh, you know, booking places for myself to perform. So it's, I've been lucky. I've been performing at good places, but that's enough for me to have uh, only a few. So I have not been affected by... Uh, COVID um, as much as other performing musicians, I guess. How do you see all of this kind of coming back to life? You know, we're at a point now where we have a new administration. There's plans. 
There's things that are starting to move forward. People are talking about shows that are going to start happening this year. How do you see all of this kind of coming back together and, and unfolding? I, I don't really know uh, how it's going to play out because uh, definitely the world has changed with this. And not because we never had any viruses before, but because how the world has treated this uh, situation. And I don't want to say it, 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 it's a wrong treatment. I, I just say that we never shut down anything because of something was going around, like a uh, flu or uh, anything. And, and definitely now people are, are very scared. And a lot of people has changed their mode of life, operations, and I, I think they will be continue to be scared to go to visit uh, public performances. Not some of them, of course, not all, all people. Some people will be glad to go back to normal, and some people probably will never never get back to normal. So I don't know. I think it's, it hurt the performing industry and performing like venues really badly uh, for a long time, if if not forever. But, of course, I might be wrong. And I hope that um, so what's going to happen, a lot of musicians who wanted to earn a big buck on, on, on performing and they were not adequate to even, like, they will, like, definitely, they will change their occupation. And, and those true, real, like, great performance, they will still find the you know, they will be still in business because uh, I don't think uh, <laughs> I don't think will uh, it will ever happen that live performance would get out of fashion. Or I mean, there is nothing like live performance, and and definitely there are you know people who who crave uh, to that live atmosphere. You cannot have it on on the record, the live um, feel and, and the excitement of things going right in front of your eyes and, and how musicians themselves feel when they they have public in front of them. So that will never go out of fashion and never will disappear. I am pretty sure about it. But um, I, I totally agree. So on Adventures of a Wildflower, it's the life, death, and rebirth of the Columbine flower, uh, backed up by a Finnish ensemble It sounds like quite an epic journey that you've gone through with material that fits on two discs. Talk to me a little bit about kind of how this idea came about, this ensemble, and kind of the general aesthetic of of this whole project now that it's materialized and people are listening to it. I read about uh, the scientific, um, in scientific magazine, uh, somebody brought it to my attention an article about how plants communicate within each other. And it really sparked my interest because uh, I love nature, of course, uh, and nature is always a source of inspiration, but never consider that plants can be, like, more than they are, like that they can be considered as almost like animals, like that they have uh, a way to communicate with each other, and definitely, uh, I wanted to explore this idea, and uh, I, I, I thought how you know the little flower might feel, and what life of little flower might might be, um, if uh, we assume that that flower can feel and communicate with uh, the world outside. And I, you know, I always, uh, I'm. I am kind of that's my my thing. I I like to write music based on um, something concrete and some like story or certain um, images, certain uh, concepts. So that that I was really um, excited about this uh, writing a story about the flower and writing music that would express uh, all those. Uh, uh, things that uh, came along with the story, like uh, how the the flower germinates and how uh, you know the, the things that happen and that's around that flower. And I had a lot of fun with uh, songs like chickens, for example. I have my own 
chicken coop, so I kind of like I know how chickens be, chickens behave, and and I um, uh, that since my flower absorbed chickens, so I had a song chickens uh, on the CD, for example, which doesn't have a, a, a direct connection to to the flower, but it indirect butterflies and hummingbirds and all kind of things that I I was excited to uh, write music for. Um, rain and uh, drought and all, all that stuff. What do you ultimately want the listener that buys this or downloads this to get from this experience? I don't think it was my goal because it's always my goal to uh, bring something positive to the world. Uh, something to the, like my input as an artist, I think, I um I'm an artist who wants to everybody to feel um positive about life and uh about human kind and and I I see good things everywhere in everybody and everything and I uh kind of like I I want people to live um in friendship and in mutual respect and enjoy life because it's so precious and enjoy good things in life and kind of like um i guess my story would bring that uh feel feeling of uh, uh almost like child like uh wonder of life and uh peace offering of peace and love and friendship and loyalty it's all expressed kind of in and um, uh, of course i'm not uh, moralizing anything but just in in the way that uh, uh, the story is, I think, that uh, music also reflects it. I think that's a very positive message that uh, it's bringing. Um, Wonderful. When we do get back to live music, you know, when you get back on the stage and we get back in the audience as fans, what do you hope we realize about this time away from music? I was not away from music uh, per se because, I, uh, I mean, for me... Uh, uh, Everything kind of went the way it was. Of course, I, I, I feel for um, a lot of musicians who, who who actually had to feel that withdrawal from being on a stage and in front of audiences. And but for me, the, in, my audience is it hasn't changed. It's, it would be nice, of course, to from time to time to address uh, the live audience, and and it's nothing like that. But I am um, applying to appealing to audience uh, in the world. You know, all the people who, in now, more than ever, everyone, can, pretty much in the world, can can hear the music, uh, my music also because it's everywhere and all kind of uh, platforms. And so, uh, and that's that's my audience. But sometimes I get messages from. People who like in the countries I, I, I didn't even know exist, <laughs> who actually access uh, and re- listen to the music. So that's what I think unites people now. You know, from all uh, countries, all cultures, uh, music unites people. And I'm very excited, very like uh, happy to be able to deliver that message. It takes so much work and uh, everything, so much dedication, but. You know, it's all worthy, I think. I agree. Helena, thank you for taking some time to talk about this world of ours, your new album. Good luck with it. And it actually comes out in March 19th, correct? Yes. Which would be ceremoniously just about six days past when the country shut down last year. So it's probably yeah. proof that things are getting back and, uh, you know, hopefully we're on the upswing. Yes, yes, yes. We, we all hope for the best, and definitely there are things that are improving already. And, you know, I hope my um, album will kind of cheer up a lot of people. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Moscow, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Yelena for her talents and time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, 
Enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.